Live from New York, it's Louis Berardi joining me on this week's NFL podcast. Louis was on one of my first shows five years ago, believe it or not, and now he's back to talk quarterback drama, early season reflections, tanking, and more. It was a lot of fun, and I hope you enjoy it. All right, Louis, so we've got a lot to talk about this week. Uh, pretty crazy. We have at least six or seven teams that will be going in to week three without the quarterback that they used to start the season in week one due to injuries uh, and a couple of quarterbacks getting benched. It's crazy. But obviously the top two, Ben Roethlisberger and Drew Brees uh, with the Steelers and the Saints respectively. Big Ben out for the entire season. Drew Brees out for, we think, about six weeks, so get him back in the middle of the year. Uh, But for the Steelers, first of all, they're already 0-2. Mason Rudolph, the backup quarterback. I mean, are they just dead at this point? Like, what do we think about the Steelers? Well, I I wouldn't think they they would be trying to go for anything this year, but they just traded a first-round pick away for uh, safety. So who knows? Maybe they have a, a lot of faith in Mason Rudolph and... They think their division is easier than it looks. I mean, so, A, to talk about their division, I mean, Baltimore obviously looks like they're killing it, but Baltimore will come back down to earth, and I think it will be one of the easier divisions in the league. I'm not expecting any trouble from the Bengals. We've already shown that the Browns are maybe not quite the team we thought they were going to be. But, yeah, the the trade is really interesting because, again, I think the Steelers are probably headed for, like, six wins, Um, and maybe that's even, like, generous with Mason Rudolph. Uh, but yeah, they're trading away their first round pick, and yeah, Fitzpatrick will help them. Um, but if you also think about it, Big Ben, if he comes back next season, he's going to be 38. Like this is this was going to be the pick that they could use on you know the the replacement, the future, the quarterback of the future. But instead, they're throwing it away to chase something this year. I mean, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, uh, I, I'm not sure how many years uh, Fitzpatrick is under contract for, but if they don't have any faith in next year's quarterbacks, and they uh, they try to uh, do a Broncos a la 2015, where they just won with their defense and the quarterback being a game manager, it's not a terrible idea for, for next year. Yeah, and, and Fitzpatrick is only in his second season. He was the 11th pick in 2018, so obviously you're getting a ton of value. Um and is he worth the pick in a vacuum? Uh, I think probably. Um, but again, it just depends on what they're going to be able to do with it. And yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, I, I think any uh, any player who's shown that they're worth whatever expected value could be had from a first round pick should be worth a first round pick in a trade. Just because of picking somebody in the first round is not an indication of success. Uh, you know, it's not. I, I think trading for somebody that you already know is good is a better indication, like uh, the Texans trading for Laramie Tunsil, even though it was a little too much. Yeah, uh, and in general, I think trade values in the NFL are really wonky. Like in the NBA, you know, if you want to trade for Paul George, it's like, okay, be prepared to give us your first in 2020 and 2021 and 2022 and 2024 and 2026 or whatever. You know, you throw in pick after pick after pick. And in sure. the NFL, it's like, you want Antonio Brown? Like, give us your fourth. Yeah, the, the NBA has a lot less value to be had in the draft than the NFL. Yeah, the NFL, I mean, it's it's so weird. And I guess also uh, player longevity is kind of more difficult to track, especially for, like, the running back position and in some regards the receiver position as well, uh, where guys kind of can really quickly kind of fall off. Um, but sure, it, sure. it's really interesting. Uh, yeah, like a thirty a thirty year old running back has like no value, whereas a thirty year old, I mean a point a thirty year old point guard in the NF, in the NBA right now is literally just like James Harden, like maybe the best player yeah, in the hit, league, hitting his prime at thirty. Yeah, uh, and he's well, I mean, around you, there. You got your uh, you got your Frank Gore's who hit their primes at thirty seven. Frank Gore's amazing, and by the way, Larry <laughs> Larry Fitzgerald has his best first two weeks uh, of a season in his career right now. Really? He's over 100 in both weeks. Well, it must be great when they're uh, chasing scores all the time. I, I mean, yeah, but at the same time, like, I feel like he's been a guy that we've, we thought was going to retire like two, three years in a row now. And, you know, what if he just keeps getting better? I mean, to Look, be- I, 
I came into the football world in 2012, and in 2012, you told me Larry Fitzgerald was already too old. So I, I might have. Um, and I, I saw Larry Fitzgerald, the first football game I ever went to, uh, in 2004. We road tripped to Arizona to see the Arizona play the Giants, and Larry Fitzgerald was a rookie, and he was making plays in that game. I think he caught the game-winning touchdown in that game. And, really? Yeah, that's and that's 2004, and you know he's still doing his thing. Uh, he's second all time in receiving yards. So of course, like if he keeps playing a couple of years, it's like you know, will he, uh, you know, catch Jerry Rice or whatever? If you, but what's crazy, and this is at this point we've far far gone off the beaten path, and that's totally fine. But if you look at the all time receiving yards list, Larry Fitzgerald is in second place behind Jerry Rice. He is like sixty five hundred yards behind Jerry Rice. It is unbelievable the gap that man has in first place. Well, Jerry Rice had a productive career. He had a long career. He had a, had a healthy career. I mean, career. obviously, I think a lot of people consider him the goat, just like of any position. Uh, and I it, really, I haven't it, heard that. It, it, it's, um, I think, maybe more a debatable thing now. If you want to, a lot of people are probably going to say Tom Brady or, or whatnot. But at one point, I think it was, I don't know, I don't know. It, it was, it was some years ago at this point. But they did a. NFL, I think they did a top 100 greatest players of all time, and, and Jerry Rice was the number one. So maybe he's not the most impactful individual player, but A, he might be, uh, and B, for his position, I definitely think he is, if not one of the top two or three. Um, sure, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, to, to, go, to come back to reality, I think the Steelers probably looking at six-ish wins this season. Is there any... Th- any reason to go against that? Um, I haven't really seen their schedule, but just based on their division, six or seven wins seems pretty pretty logical. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we know we know who they're playing the the two in the division, and um, they already got their game at, against the Patriots out of the way, which I guess is somewhat of a good sign if you're gonna try to find wins for them. Um, they're at the 49ers this week, which I think will be a struggle. Um, they still got. Yeah, that's... You know, yeah, they the still got. The Niners seem to have a pretty good defense. Their only saving grace, I think, is um, their AFC division that they play is the AFC East. So they they will get the Jets and they will get the Dolphins. So that's probably two. Um, but outside of that, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty difficult for this team moving forward. I think the Jets are gonna be a tough out this year with Sam Darnold. I mean, you know, once he can uh, get back into action. Let me look when. when once he stops eating so many snacks. Yeah, yeah, snacks. That's what we're going to call it, snacks. Uh, God, I love all those memes. Um, yeah, so they, they play they play the, the Jets on December 22nd. So unless Sam Darnold misses 14 weeks due to snacks, um, <laughs> he'll probably be suiting up for that game. Um, but for now, the, the Jets quarterback is uh, Luke Falk. And between Luke Falk and Gardner Minshew, uh, there are now two starting quarterbacks in the NFL that came out of Washington State, which is pretty crazy. It's turning into Mike Leach over there, turning it, uh, turning them into well, the new quarterback university. I think Gardner Minshew is the uh, new mold for the NFL quarterback, and I'm being pretty serious about this. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, obviously he's had that air raid experience in college, which I think is going to help him, and Leach and all that when he was with Tech, and, um, you know, that kind of offense got turned into Cliff Kingsbury's offense, which, you know, Mahomes and Kyler Murray, so a lot of quarterbacks coming from these similar kind of systems. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so talk a little bit about why you think Gardner Minshew is so special or maybe the mold. Well, so so, so from what I've seen, the league has uh, moved on from – Big, tall, strong, immobile quarterbacks who so a little bit shorter, a little bit, little bit more athletic. You know, get out of the pockets, make make some plays there. Yeah, so basically um, not Eli Manning. Yeah, basically not Eli Manning <laughs> or Daniel Jones. The Daniel Jones you're, can move, but yeah, yeah. You're you're always going to have your um your standout players like Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers. You know, even though. Yeah, but you, you're always going to have players like that who break the mold and are special in their own certain ways. But besides that, the rest of the league in the past tended to uh, to go towards an Eli Manning prototype, if you right. will. Yeah. Right. But, but now they're going more towards a uh, 
Drew Brees or a Russell Wilson type. It, it does feel like that, and like Lamar Jackson even. It's just a sure, lot more. Uh, Kyler Murray is not the tallest. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not by any stretch of the imagination. A lot of the, I think what's interesting is we are seeing a lot of the uh, the old notions about quarterbacks being too short to play kind of get thrown getting thrown out of the water with a lot of the, a lot of the new quarterbacks uh but just outside outside of his height uh which again is i think it's one of those older things that's just gonna gonna fade out and probably wasn't as important hasn't as important as people made it out to be to begin with um but i think you know obviously he he, he feel like he can make the throws um it's just going to be more about developing into the nfl offense we did see them struggle for most of the game against Houston last week, but when uh, it came down to crunch time, it seemed like he found a way to get things moving, and especially with his legs. Yeah, no, I I sadly watched that whole game, and in the, in the fourth quarter, he had two drives that were pretty pretty good looking. You know, it was very fast paced. Uh, I think they were running some RPOs, and for to me, that looks like the future of the league: fast paced. Uh, Run some, run some RPOs. Yeah. Get, get the quarterback out of the pocket. Yeah, and, and just keep the de- keep the defenses guessing, and you know whenever yeah. whenever they're whenever they're down or you know just hit them quick repeatedly, march down the field. Um, yeah, good stuff there. So Luke Falk, who was like a sixth round pick, or was he undrafted? Let me let me look that up. Uh, I feel like he was like a sixth round pick. Uh, yeah, sixth round pick. Um, Last year, in last year's draft, went to the Titans, and then Gardner Minshew, who was a sixth-round draft pick this year with the Jacksonville Jaguars. They're both now starting quarterbacks, which shows you how fast reality hits you uh, when you're playing in the National Football League. But, of course, another big quarterback that went down uh, last week in their Week 2 matchup against the Seahawks, or I'm sorry, not the Seahawks, but the Rams, um, was Drew Brees. And Drew Brees is 40 years old, but he's now got this uh, a ligament injury with his thumb that'll take him out six weeks or so. The backup is Teddy Bridgewater. Before the season, I had the Saints as my pick to come out of the NFC. Um, and now, obviously, it becomes a lot more shaky. I think this is something... Uh, the benefit for them, I think, is that they're in the most winnable division in the NFC. Would you agree with that? Uh, sure, yeah. The Falcons and the Panthers don't look... Like they did a few years ago. Yeah. And the Buccaneers aren't. I mean, yeah, football. like the NFC East, the Cowboys and the Eagles, one of them is going to win 11, 12 games. Uh, looks like the Packers are good, and also the Vikings and the Bears will cause some trouble. Maybe even the Lions in that uh, yeah, NFC. Beat the Chargers. In the, in the North. And then the West, we've got three uh, 2 0 teams, which is pretty incredible. Uh, in the Seahawks, the Rams, and the 49ers. The NFC West is looking really good. And even the Cardinals look like they could be better than we thought. Sure. And the Cardinals are missing a lot of players. They're missing their top two cornerbacks. Yeah. And if the Cardinals win against the Panthers this week, which I expect them to, even they are up to 1-1-1. One, one, and one. <laughs> It sounds stupid, but, you know, like this, the NFC West, I mean, it really could be shaping up to be a heck of a division. Um, yeah, as as it was four or five years ago. Yeah, so the Saints, uh, lucky lucky for them, they don't have to play in that division. Uh, they do have to play against teams in that division. But six weeks or so without Drew Brees, the backup quarterbacks. I don't think an official starter has been named yet, but they're you know they're gonna they're gonna do their little mishmash with Teddy Bridgewater and their uh, Swiss Army player Taysom Hill. Right. And, uh, honestly, I don't have a lot of faith in the Saints' offense until Drew Brees returns. Well, here is my thinking. I don't think the Saints are going to be significantly worse without Drew Brees. Well, yeah, I mean, tell me why. I mean, I think the defense is still going to be good as long as they can stop getting screwed by the referees. Um, so, Drew Brees doesn't throw deep anymore. Their offense uh, has been very much a short-passing, quick West Coast offense, if you will, mm-hmm. and um, Teddy Bridgewater can can perform that. He can he can make the throws. He's he's good enough for that. And especially with the coaching of Sean Payton, who coaches really well, who play, calls plays really well, and prepares for games really well. Uh, I don't know if they're going to fall off a lot in production. 
Uh, and I, you have the un- unexpected quality of both Drew Brees and Hill thrown in there for a few weeks until teams can start to figure them out. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, I think Teddy Bridgewater has never returned to the form that we saw him in in 2014, 2015, before he suffered the the terrible knee injury, which took him out for all of 2016 and a good chunk of 17. At this mm-hmm. point, this is really, if, if Teddy Bridgewater's career, and I think this is a big storyline in this as well, if Teddy Bridgewater is to have the career revival, uh, it, it's going to have to happen and it's going to need to happen right now. This is his opportunity that he's been looking for for the last few years. He's going to take a team... Uh, you know, obviously they got all the talent around him. It's 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 gonna a big deal is gonna be on him to kind of uh, a manage the game well, if you want to use the cliche. But also, I think to kind of lead this team because Drew Brees has been their leader for you know 15 years now, and I feel like a lot of the time in the in that Rams game that unfortunately you know turned into a big loss for them. It if they needed some kind of a spark, and it just wasn't there. I don't think Bridgewater was brought in to be the backup. I think he was brought in to be the bridge quarterback in between uh, Drew Brees retiring and them possibly finding a new franchise quarterback. So I think it's a sort of a step above backup, you know? Because if I'm Teddy Bridgewater, I, I, I've i started in the NFL, I wouldn't go to a team if they just told me I was going to back up a Hall of Fame quarterback. I, I think that was kind of his only option, though. Uh, because well, well, so what happened is he 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 uh, the Vikings I guess re- uh, released him or maybe traded him to the Jets uh, because by that point when he came back they already had Kirk Cousins uh, and then the Jets ended up trading him to the Saints so maybe the Saints did see him as the replacement for Drew Brees they probably did uh, but also it's just a big risk with him coming off you know the injuries with his history um, so I'm not. Again, I'm not I'm not super high on him. I, I would love to see him return to, you know, he even made the Pro Bowl in 2015, which was his last kind of full season as a starter, and only his second season in the league. By the way, he's still only like 27 now, so he's got the yeah, time I, to do it. But it's again, there's just a lot of question marks for me. I'd I'd be hard pressed to put the Saints anywhere below nine and seven. Yeah, I don't think they go. I'm still taking them to win the division and to make the playoffs, but that's they're really going to have to right the ship because they can't turn it over back over to Drew Brees at like two and six per se. And I, I worry a little bit because I see their upcoming schedule. Uh, the next two games are against the Sa- Seahawks and the Cowboys, and I think those are basically going to be losses. So then we're down to one and three. Get the, I don't think the Seahawks are very good this year. I don't think it matters. I think in that first game of the transition, it's going to be difficult. And I do think the Seahawks are going to be able to pull that one out. Um, so if you think the Saints are going to win, I guess we can we can differ there. Uh, then they, yeah. do get, they do get a bit of an easy stretch after that. Uh, they get the Bucks, the Jaguars, the Bears, which will probably be tricky, especially on the road, uh, and the Cardinals. But I, I think they need to keep themselves at least 4-4 four and four, uh, by the end of that stretch. And hopefully Drew Brees returns for a big... Uh, oh, they do have the Week 9 bias. That'll help. So he should be back for what would be a really big Week 10 home game against the Falcons. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a big one. That's probably... And if and if the Saints do come into that game something like 4-4, four and four, you can imagine the Falcons will be 4-4 four and four as well, maybe 5-3 and three or something. So that, that could be a a really big, uh, big game. Mm-hmm, yep. for sure. Yep, so... And outside of that... Um, uh, you know the last couple big quarterback changes. Uh, Eli Manning gets benched for Daniel Jones. Uh, that's that's one for me, the Giants fan in the in the room. Uh, even though you're the one in New York, so we won't get into that. Uh, I am. I, I think it's time. I think I was somebody that held off against a lot of the bench Eli, trade Eli, all that nonsense that's been going on for the past two, three, four years um, because I didn't think the Giants had a future at quarterback yet. I was not sold on the Davis Webb or the Kyle Laletta or the, any of the the Geno Smith. Like, I mean, you you benched Eli, but you benched Eli that one game for Geno Smith. Like, you thought that was going to be the solution to your problem. I don't know if Geno Smith thinks Geno Smith is a good quarterback. I, I'm still really upset about the way that particular uh, situation went down. But... 
at this point, you know, stop, you know, stop drafting third round, fourth round picks with your or quarterbacks with third, fourth round picks. Find a guy you actually believe in, Daniel Jones. And the Giants aren't going to make the playoffs this year, and we knew that going into the year. So if that's the case, then just give the guy the reps that he needs. So I was kind of advocating for Daniel Jones to start from the get go, um, but at this point, uh, they said they were going to start Eli until you know they were out of playoff contention. But after the first two games, I think hard to imagine them finding their way back into playoff contention. So totally cool well, it, with totally cool with giving the ball to Daniel. Pretty difficult division. Yeah, even Washington isn't. I mean, we don't, we don't think know. Washington. Well, we don't think Washington will do much. But I mean, just having the Cowboys and the Eagles. Uh, that's two. That's two teams that have that legitimately think they are going to make the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl this season. Right. So, I know this is a radical notion, but for me, if I'm managing a team, my end goal is to win the Super Bowl. Right. This seems to be a very radical notion in the NFL because everybody goes for mediocrity. Yeah. No, no, so, no, no. Um, I, I think the Giants should have started um, Jones from the offset as well, just just because of that. If they're not going to make the Super Bowl with Eli, it's time to move on from, from Eli. That's just the end of it. Yeah, and, and we can have the Eli, is Eli a Hall of Fame debate, which I, a Hall of Famer debate, which everyone is talking about to the point that I you, you almost don't even want to talk about it. I think, in general, Eli has been a pretty average quarterback for most of his career. But I think the two Super Bowls and the longevity and just the volume of statistics will probably get him in. Um, but I, I obviously I think I think you know this is this is the time for him to pass the torch. Sure, um, absolutely. Yeah. Outside He's of that, not his brother. Yeah, yeah. Outside of that, Josh Rosen comes in to replace Ryan Fitzpatrick for the Dolphins. Will it change much? No, no, it won't. Josh Rosen has looked pretty terrible in the. Like what? Four drives he's had in the yeah, Dolphins. Yeah, yeah, he's thrown a couple picks. Uh, obviously, he didn't do great with the Cardinals after being taken by them last year because they ended up with the number one overall pick and they picked his replacement. Uh, clearly, Arizona had not the highest expectations for Josh Rosen. You gotta um, feel bad for the man, though. He's stuck in the worst team in the league for two years in a row. Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Uh, and then Cam Newton also question mark for. Uh, for week three with a lingering foot injury. But at this point, Cam Newton d- just doesn't even look remotely the same player that he was earlier in his career, even a year or two ago. So, Do you think it's injuries? Uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a combination of injuries. Uh, yeah, a lot of the hits he's taken. Um, this dude gets hit with you know things that would have drawn flags on other quarterbacks all the time, and he, you know, he has to suffer the right. hits. He, he gets a rough treatment. Uh, by and the and, and sure. more than that, I think... When you're, I mean, obviously he's he's shown his ability to, to pass the football well, um, you know, throughout his career. But I think when you enter the the league as a quote unquote athletic running quarterback, and especially as a big quarterback, uh, because it's not like he's, you know, he looks more like Ben Roethlisberger than he looks like Kyler Murray. Uh, uh-huh, I think, for sure, for and now sure. and now into now into his thirties, um, I think his his. Just game style and his body style kind of deteriorate maybe a little faster than some other guys. Do you think there's a mental aspect to it? Like uh, subconsciously, his body says, "Oh, I I don't want to take this hit and get hurt, so I'm not going to make this play," or something along those lines. I mean, is this a direct reference to the not dumping on the fumble in the Super Bowl? Uh, no, I mean, yeah. maybe I've seen that play and it's pretty hideous, but. A lot, a lot of people call him lazy. I don't, you know, I, I think that's ridiculous. No, uh, but no, it I, might be like a subconscious mental thing where his body just doesn't let him do the things that he used to because he's gotten hurt so much just because of his style of play. I think, I think it's possible. I'm not in the business of speculating too much, but I think it's a lot of those times when you get those injuries. You know, even when you're a basketball player and you have an ankle injury. You know, every time you're coming down from the jump shot, you might be thinking about it, right? And that subconsciously kind of, uh, or even consciously maybe alters your performance a little bit. Yeah, because, I mean, he's he's a genera- generational talent, Cam Newton. Yeah. So it, there has to be a mental part of his game that's off somehow. Yeah, um, and again, yeah, I mean, they've really struggled. I mean, I think, I think he, A, he still wasn't healed coming into the season. And I think you can no. tell that by the fact no, that... He had 100 rushing yards through his first two games last year, 
And this year, through two games, he has negative two. <laughs> Uh, and they had a lot of four, and they had a lot of fourth down situations, third and ones, fourth and ones in their game last week against the Bucks, where they, you know, they were they were not letting him run the ball. You know, they were throwing it on fourth and one. They were giving it to McCaffrey on this like wildcat kind of play, like you know. Right. Theoretically, if it's fourth and one, Cam Newton um, sneaks it and nobody stops him. Yeah. Right. He's healthy. He he gets this. You would have to think. At least 80, 80 to ninety percent of the time, right? Yeah, but uh, I mean, not the case. And the fact that they didn't go to it at all tells you there's something wrong. Um, and now with this extra injury as well, so it'll be interesting for the Panthers moving forward. I think the Panthers are a team. Yeah, it's, yeah it's this, something that it, scares it, me about it uh, could go Deshaun poorly. Watson. Yeah, for sure. And Deshaun Watson, nobody's taking more hits than Deshaun Watson. A little bit is his fault. He holds the ball too long. He um, runs into contact a lot just because he wants to make make plays. This his is whole true. mentality is to make a play on every play. Yeah. Um, but again, I think it's something, a combination of the offensive line. I think it's a big reason why they brought in Tunsil. Um, and him just himself kind of developing and becoming a smarter quarterback. Uh, it's a lot of these times. With the running quarterback, it's like, do you want to take – eight yards and get out of bounds or take 10 and get a hit and you know when you're 22 years old you know it's always you know well i need that i need that first down now or whatever um but right, as you, well you know, as, you know deshaun is a good passing quarterback though let's not no of course um, let's not call it cowherd this yeah um if, if, we're, if we're gonna runner in a non-natural runner. yeah if we were gonna call him this i'd be talking about baker mayfield um yeah, I mean, Deshaun Watson. I mean, obviously, yeah, he's he's a quarterback. I mean, he has MVP potential. He really does. Um, yeah, yeah, all we need to do is fire Bill O'Brien's dumbass. How are you going to do that? You don't have a general manager. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's rough. It's rough. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on to all this quarterback stuff, because honestly, it's a mess, and it's only going to keep being a mess. Um, looking at just overall uh, reflections from the first two weeks of the season uh, any teams that jump out to you as performing uh, well in, in either direction significantly better or worse than you thought they would so the Packers are uh, doing pretty good on the defensive side of the ball because right. they finally learned what free agency is yeah yeah good for them get Rodgers some yeah. help yeah um Rodgers hasn't looked the same mm. as he has uh, mm. in the past few years, but I just saw an inter- interview with him yeah. from uh, a couple of days ago, and he said that he's been injured. Okay. So maybe that has something to do with it. Yeah, because I hadn't, I hadn't heard that. But, I mean, yeah, and I feel like he's one of those quarterbacks as well that's probably just in, like, a perpetual state of something's hurting. Um, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, what I've said, what I wrote up, in my write-up for my power rankings, is I think I have the I have the Packers up to I had them at number six this week, um, and I said, you know, if if the concern about the Packers is the offense, they're in good shape. Yeah, for sure. Because at, at any point, Aaron Rodgers can make some magic. Uh, yeah, abs- we've seen ab- absolutely. Every year, absolutely. And then, kind of staying in that division, I think on the flip side of it, the Chicago Bears look not not good. Um, they went what thir- thirteen games? Maybe they won last year, twelve or thirteen. Um, well, it was it was always going to be a defensive team. Uh, yeah, yeah, and but at the same point, you can't win with just defense. So you're going to need the step up from the offense. You, they were going to need a transitional year from Mitch Trubisky, turning into just kind of this like average or you know borderline replacement quarterback to a Pro Bowl level quarterback if they're going to win the Super Bowl. Uh, I do. I, I believe. Kind of. I believe that. Um, and the, then week the one, the Bears have, have won a Super Bowl with a bad quarterback before, and they've made it to a, another Super Bowl with a very bad quarterback before. Yeah, Rex Grossman. Um, but you know, I mean, still, I think it's a different league, right? If you're going up against, it doesn't matter how good your defense is. If the quarterbacks in the Super Bowl are Patrick Mahomes and Mitchell Trubisky, the Bears aren't going to win. 
Um, and so they had a chance to bounce back against the Broncos. Really, I mean, they threw the game, but they got lucky enough to um, get a chance with 20 seconds left, and they get a roughing the passer penalty. And Mitch Trubisky does make one great play to set them up in field goal range with one second left on the clock, and then they their kicker actually made a field goal. So that's, that's earth-shattering news. Yeah, that's very good for Chicago. Yeah. First, uh, Bears kicker making a field goal since Hollis was the head coach, I think? Yeah, I think it has been about 70 years. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, but, uh, yeah, so good for them to actually get the win. But outside of that, I, I think this team has really struggled, and I don't have near the um, near the expectations for them as I did uh, entering the season. Uh, I think they've really struggled. Um... I mean, I can talk as much as I can about how disappointed I am in my Giants. And obviously the Steelers are struggling, but part of that is they've played the Patriots and the Seahawks, and they don't have Big Ben. Um, I think the yeah, Bills... The, yeah. the Bears are going to be a tough out every week just because their defense is so good. Right. They're, you know, they're going to be a 9-7, and 10-6 and six kind of team, but they're going to be very difficult to play against, yeah, especially and they're, mm-hmm. weather starts getting cold. Chicago starts getting rowdy. Yeah, and I think they're a type of team that even in the games where they look outmatched, you know, they could get crushed for four quarters, and the final score would only be like sixteen to seven, right? So it doesn't even it yeah. doesn't even look that terrible. So they're like a deceptively good team, or does that mean they're a deceptively bad team? I don't really, I don't really know. Um, but uh, <laughs> either one, I guess, depending yeah. on uh, where you're coming from. The yeah. Beginning of the season. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Baltimore. Because this sure. is the team that's came out of, you know, I mean, I don't want to say out of nowhere because they actually did win that division last season, but I think it was a team that a lot of people had behind, and I had behind, the Steelers and the Browns, uh, and they come out in week one and they score 59 points on the Miami Dolphins. And they sure do. It is not quite as smooth in week two, but they do uh, have another great performance from Lamar Jackson, and they... Uh, win that game against the Arizona Cardinals. So all of a sudden, the Ravens are 2-0, and and in Week 3, they're playing the Chiefs. And this is a humongous matchup between two of the league's young star quarterbacks. Right. So, man, I, I'm in two minds about the Ravens. I can't. I don't know if, uh, if um, Jackson is the real deal or if Jackson is RG3 year one. I don't know if their defense is okay or if their defense is terrible because they lost so many players from last year Mm -hmm. Um, so i think this this week is really going to give us a very good insight on what the ravens actually are i would agree with that and i think it's easy to throw up well actually no i'm gonna change that i mean i think 59 points is impressive no matter who you're playing against uh just the fact that you can do that to an nfl team but i think the dolphins did kind of fall apart really early in that game and once they were down three or four touchdowns it was just kind of I mean, they almost right, gave, they almost gave, they, they almost gave up, right? And they just kind of let them start marching down the field and just doing whatever they wanted to. Uh, and Harbaugh yeah. didn't help by running sixty-yard fake punts uh, just to even rub it in on Miami. Um, well, I don't, I don't think running up the score is a thing, right? You score as many points as you can. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's a, it's a competitive match. Absolutely, but I think it also it just made them feel even more demoralized, um, which I guess right. is the it's, goal. It, it's it's like the thing in the women's World Cup when the U.S. won what was it twelve to zero? Uh, yeah, we got through thirteen on Thailand. Right. I don't think there was anything wrong with that, and I don't think there's anything wrong with celebrating those goals. Absolutely not. I was definitely one of those people that was in that same kind of camp of. I mean, you know, this is the World Cup. If you're not trying yeah. to score in the World Cup, like, what are you doing? Right. The games played for for ninety minutes. You you play for ninety minutes. It's. I feel like it's more disrespectful to stop playing after 50 because you think you you know you've won already. I would agree. I would agree. Um, so, yeah, moving on to the Ra- – or, or going back to the Ravens, rather. Yeah, Lamar Jackson, I mean, he's done incredible things for these first two weeks. And I do think at some point, how many more performances can we take from this guy before he's, you know, and, and say, oh, it's just a fluke one week, it's just a fluke one week. You know, this is the second year of him playing really well. Um Obviously, he's still going to have his personal issues. Of you know, he fumbled the ball a lot last season. Although I don't believe he's turned the ball over yet this year. So this game against the Chiefs is going to be really big. Uh, the Chiefs have another exploitable defense. 
Um, but obviously with Mahomes on the other side of the ball, and I do think the Ravens' defense is, is pretty good as well. Um, but with Mahomes on the other side of the ball, and we've seen what Mahomes can do, he had 280 yards and four touchdowns in just one quarter in Week 2. Um, you know, This is going to be a massive <laughs> test. And yeah, I can just say that casually. Um, yeah, he is... He's not too bad, is he? This is this is a game where Lamar Jackson is, you know, it's it's one of those de- kind of defining performances of, you know, what will you do in a really big game? Right, and um, I had a point to make, but I forgot. Oh, I don't think the I, I think the rape rating on CJ Mosley was one of the worst moves of the offseason. Yeah. Because they clearly have a winning team right now, and he is maybe the best middle linebacker in football right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I don't know why they did that. Honestly, I that yeah, seems really dumb to me. But yeah. whatever. That's why um, I'm not a GM, I guess. Yeah. Right. Um. So speaking about GM, something GMs do is they make trades. Uh, we've had a lot of interesting things happening already early this season. Uh, players requesting trades. We had uh multiple Dolphins players after their week one loss trying to get out of the tank trying to trade themselves away so the Dolphins trade Minka Fitzpatrick to the Steelers which is something we've already talked about Uh, in Jacksonville Jalen Ramsey is requesting a trade Uh, in uh, Dallas Taco Charlton requested a trade Uh, he eventually got released and signed by Miami so who knows if that's what he actually wanted or not but he's out of there Melvin Gordon is still in his uh, holdout, maybe looking for a trade there. Uh, you know, we have a lot of players that are requesting trades or holding out in recent years, uh, and this year specifically, we have Antonio Brown, uh, who had his you know entire ordeal to get himself onto the Patriots. So I want to ask you about this idea of the players uh, inc- asking for trades, and is it you know is it good bad for the league? Um, to have all this movement, and what is it inspired by? Is it inspired by Antonio Brown? Is it inspired by all these things happening in the NBA? Uh, is it inspired by just like social media and more player-focused culture as a whole? Um, where where do we think this is all coming from? Right. Obviously, I'm not an NFL player, and I don't know anybody who's an NFL player, so this is all speculation. But from what I've seen of uh, interviews and things in social media and stuff it seems to be heavily influenced by the nba a lot of players mention how uh how much freedom nba players have and um all that stuff so that seems to be a something that uh i've seen as a trend yeah um however at the same point i feel what antonio brown did in particular was really terrible he was just kind of gonna you know do anything he could to kind of get himself released and it comes back to Anthony Davis and his whole (coughs) saga to uh, kind of force himself out of New Orleans and Kawhi Leonard and other people I don't feel like players should be allowed to just stop playing and kind of my way or the highway in a professional organization however what we've seen time and time again is that the star players are given these kind of affordances and they get this special treatment Right. Um, again, this is a complicated subject because if I were a player, I'd want to do everything in my power to be on a winning team, to be in a good art organization and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But what we don't want to do is go back to the times where there's a few teams dominating and everybody else is just not very good because nobody wants to play for them. Yeah. Uh, so, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I... If somebody presented me this problem and told me to solve it, I wouldn't know how to solve it right now. Yeah, and I think part of it is, I mean, players have every right to, you know, say, you know, I want to be a part of a winning culture. I think that's kind of Jalen Ramsey's biggest deal, and I think he's been feuding with Doug Marone. They had, like, a big kind of deal on the sidelines last week, and I don't know they what did. that was they about. Did. Um, but that didn't look good at all. Um, and, yeah, um... I guess holdouts are different. I, I, in general, kind of support the player holdout. But a lot of these trade things, I think Antonio Brown is, you know, kind of disgusting. Everything, again, that he was doing. Um, Antonio Brown has done a lot of disgusting things. Recently. Yeah, yeah. 
and that's well, even part of it's still on, on, ongoing, obviously. You know, if you look at it in a um, in a capitalist sense, you would think that what this would do is make the teams improve so that players would want to come to them, mm -hmm. you know? So the, the Jaguars would see the situation and it, they would go, oh, clearly something isn't working. We're going to try to improve something and make it better so that players want to come to us instead of wanting to leave us. But yeah. I, I, I don't know if this is going to happen because of conservative management in the NFL and because some teams are just are always going to be more well-established and better run than others. And another thing is, I think when you're coming from the Dolphins, a, lot, a reason why uh, a lot of the Dolphins players wanted to leave is because they think their team is tanking, and their team is, I mean, honestly, pretty obviously tanking. I don't think they have any intentions to really win football games this season. They just kind of want that first overall pick. And I know this is something I want to talk about because I know we have uh, different differing opinions on kind of this whole deal. Right now, coming into week three, uh, we have the Dolphins now are at a point where they are 23-point underdogs to the Dallas Cowboys after being outscored 102-10 to 10 in their first two games. This is the second biggest spread of the last 10 years. Um, and obviously, the Patriots and Jets have another massive 20-plus point spread, but I think that was just more due to kind of injuries uh, and the quarterback situation more than anything else. But you think that the Dolphins are doing the right thing by tanking and basically throwing in the towel from the get-go. So talk to me a little bit about that. Sure. Well, let me ask you a question, Connor. Yep. If, if you'll allow me. Yep. Who won the Super Bowl in 1985? Uh, that would be the Bears. Who had the first overall pick in 1985? Is, this the, is the answer the Bears? I don't know this. No, I, no, I was like, I, I, I no, I, you don't know what the answer is. No, I was like, it couldn't be the Bears. They were already, they were already doing their thing. Uh, I'll look this up for the heck of it, but. Well, I, I guess who who had the number one overall pick in nineteen eighty six would would have been better part of my analogy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The point is, you don't know. Yeah. Right. The goal is to no. win a Super Bowl. Who went eight and eight in nineteen eighty five? Who cares? My point is. History remembers victories and achievements and Super Bowl wins, right? Nobody cares if you had the first overall pick at one year, two years, three years in a row. Nobody cares. Nobody cares if you went in eight and eight. Nobody cares if you went twelve and four and lost in the divisional round. The goal is to win the Super Bowl, and they weren't going to do it without tanking. So, my thought on the Dolphins is yes, they're gonna. They're, it looks like they're going to achieve their dreams, right? They're going to go winless or they'll you know they'll just lose as many games as they can and they'll get the number one overall pick that is great i think tanking is wrong from an ethical perspective uh i think if you have teams that are you know in playoff races fighting to make the playoffs and you know let's say you know the uh the ravens get a game against the bills and the ravens end up beating the bills by 40 and it's an easy win for them or, or the dolphins uh, but maybe a team they're fighting for the division, maybe the Browns don't play the Dolphins, and that could be a desire in the division because the uh, you know the Ravens get an extra game against a team that's effectively not even trying, right? If you want to go beyond that, it kind of I think it kind of sucks for the fans. It's basically uh, you know don't even bother showing up to our games this season. We're not even going to try to win. From a player's perspective, I think it's even not ethical there. Uh, because if your if your goal is not to win, then you're still sending players out there to get injured potentially to, you know, to look bad on film, whatever. I think it's just it. it maybe it's the m most, maybe it's the best strategy from an organizational perspective if you really think that the number one overall pick is going to change your team, uh, which maybe it will in some cases. But in general, the number one overall picks aren't even as valuable as they are in say the NBA. Um, but I think, I mean, for all the reasons I was kind of talking about, I just don't think it's the right thing to do, even if it feels like the right thing to do. Sure, th that all makes sense, the thing with the players and the fans. And for sure, the fans shouldn't go to games, right? Like, they, 
It's not much it, of a point. If, pretty, I a, if I was a fan of a tanking team, I wouldn't go to the games. I wouldn't watch the games. They don't deserve my attention. Right. But if, if this is a way that helps them, or, you know, it for me, it maximizes the goal of, of getting to and winning a Super Bowl. Yeah. Because the, the, the more earlier picks you have, the more chances you have to hit on something like that. Sometimes you'll find a Tom Brady in the sixth. How many times does that happen in history? Once. Twice. Gardner Minshew. <laughs> Right? Yeah. And the the players know this. They'll they'll want to get traded, that's fine. Trade the players, get more picks, then you'll have uh new players on long contracts and those new players just wanna mostly establish themselves. Maybe in three, four years the Dolphins will be good and that's that should be fine with the players as it's fine with me. Yeah. As it should be fine with the fans. You know, I would take four years of being the worst team in the league to win the Super Bowl the year after. Hey, I'm a Giants fan. I know a lot about this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we take our two Super Bowls and we head to the bank. Uh, and yeah, we're pretty awful in every other year. Eli Manning, this is amazing. This is an amazing statistic. Eli Manning has been the starting quarterback for the Giants effectively 15 seasons. He has won playoff games in two of those seasons. Now, he's, wow. he's made the playoff. He made the playoffs like six times. But, you know, four years he was one and done, and the other two years they went 4-0 and and they won the Super Bowl. So it's pretty funny. That's Um, that's wild. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So, I mean, the the problem with tanking is it's one of those things that people are going to do, and you can try to discourage it in whatever ways you can, although in the NFL it gets gets difficult, too. It really does. Um, It's a thing that I understand will happen, and it's a thing that I, I mean, if you're a bad team, you're gonna, you're probably gonna lose most of your games anyways, right? Like tanking, I don't think it plays much of a, makes much of an impact on your team rather than just like the the quality of your team at the beginning of the season does as a whole. I wish, it's one of those things I wish wouldn't happen, like just from a oh we should be trying to win our games, uh, but it's something that I don't think is really. Fixable if a team is gonna trade away with their best young player, the Steelers, for a first round pick. Like this is a good decision for them, right? Probably. Um, yeah, I, I'd say so. So yeah, it helps the team. Is it good for the sport? I think that's a pretty clear no because I think you should always want teams to try to be as competitive as possible. I think that's kind of more than anything else. I think that's kind of the major complaint. Is just like a, you know, if we're not trying to win games in sports. You know, what are we even trying to do? And you're going to come back at me and say win championships, which makes sense. But I think the argument, I think you get you, you get what the argument is coming from. No, of course, of course. Yeah. And, you know, this is this is new to, I'm new to uh, American sports where the draft happens, so I'm still getting used to that. Yeah, you're still getting, well, you're probably wondering. I thought the best team, American sports is so much like other sports. I mean, the Patriots just win every year. I don't know what they're talking about, draft and competitive balance. No, it's just the Patriots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but in theory, in theory, we're supposed to embrace parity, and we're supposed to have cyclical winning cycles, you know. Um, but I don't know. I mean... Sure, I mean but I just, the Lions. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, look at a team like the Astros that were terrible for forever, and now they've, they've built themselves into a dynasty, so... And, um, and the the giants of, of baseball, the baseball giants, right. were great for a long right. time, and now they're terrible. But here's my thing. If you want to extend this out even further, at the beginning of this, I guess this, this NBA season is not the best example to use, right? Because this year we actually have, like, we think there could be six or seven teams coming out of the West, probably three or four teams coming out of the East. There's a lot of teams in play. Mm-hmm. Uh, but say you were going to go last season, right? At the beginning of the year, how many teams had a legitimate chance, let's say a you know, greater than like one or two percent chance of winning the title? We've got like three or four. We've got yeah, we've got we've got the Warriors, the Rockets, um, probably the Bucks. The Cavs. And you could say well no, last year. So not not the Cavs, but um Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you would say the the Warriors and the Rockets uh, and that might actually just be it out of the West. And then in the East, you, pro- you would probably say the Raptors, the Bucks, and, like, the Celtics, right? 
and the Sixers. And the, and the Sixers. Okay, so we'll go with six, right? So if we think there's, and even those teams in the East, none of them were probably more than like 5%, but they were all, you know, they were all at least significant. Right. Um, if we think there were six teams that could win the title at the beginning of the season, there should have been 24 tankers. Right? There going by your going by your logic, there should have been 24 tankers. Here's, here's a hint, or here's a, you know, a kind of a obvious conclusion. If there are 24 tankers in a 30-team league, the league cannot survive. You can't survive off of, like, 95% of the games aren't featuring two teams trying to win, right? It just doesn't work. Okay, but what I'm saying is for teams that are, like, really bad, you know? Like, uh, the, the, the year before last, you wouldn't have picked the Bucks to come out of the, the East. Mm-hmm. Or, I guess, before last year started. Yeah. So it's teams can always uh, improve in certain ways if if they're close that don't involve tanking. Yeah, they I'm... can get themselves like the like the Eagles. Mm-hmm. They I... just kept uh, they they kept improving because they had a solid core down. They knew they had a franchise quarterback. They knew they had a solid defense, and they knew if they added a few pieces, that's the difference between an eight and eight team and a twelve and four team that wins the Super Bowl. But what if you're like the know, what if you're like the Detroit Lions like? The Detroit Lions had a string of like seven, eight win seasons. Like they've never been bad, but if you want to retrospect, they probably should have just, you know, tanked it and tried to get picks because they were never really a team that we thought was going to make a deep run. And they may, sure, they've won maybe one. They've maybe they've won maybe one playoff game with Matt Stafford. The Lions have never won a playoff game in the history of the Lions. Yeah. So the thing is, I just th- I just think if you're if teams like the Lions would be better advised to tank, then, like, again, at some point, it's a thing where, like, it works for, maybe it's cute if, like, we have the the suck for luck that we had with the Colts, or if we have tank for Tua or whatever the heck's going on in Miami. It's cute if, like, one or two teams do it, but the problem is the strategy works. I mean, it benefits, I think, the majority of teams to do it. And in that sense, if a majority of teams ever did, it would... I mean, it would be the end of, like, the sport as we know it. Like, n- there would just be no point in caring because the product would just be awful. Right, but I mean, just just from a competitive standpoint of uh, you, hire, you hire at least semi-competent coaches and your players are at least pretty good, there's, there's always only going to be one, maybe two teams that could be in a position to tank. Mm-hmm. Right, you say tanking as if it's something that's embraced... Uh, organizationally right but it's it's not really the the Dolphins players are going out there and trying to make plays if if for nothing else for the sake of their own careers right so it's it, it's not something that you can just impose on a team it's difficult to tank yeah I think it's I think it's a good point that you make and obviously the players themselves are playing for their careers right and the NBA yeah. it was kind of easy they had the Lakers one season they had you know by the end of the year, basically all their older players, they were, you know, quote unquote resting for like the rest of the season, right? And the NFL the NFL doesn't work like that because the NFL is much more cutthroat. Um But yeah. Uh tanking well obviously the Dolphins are doing it, whether that's good or not, I mean, the choice is yours, but I think it's kinda of bad for the sport. Although it's kinda of funny in a sense of how badly will they lose this week. Uh speaking of how badly will they lose this week Taking a look at their line, and we're going to finish up by talking about some of the more intriguing matchups in Week Three. Uh, You're quickly. so good at segues. Yeah, uh, thank you for the Fantastic compliment. Fantastic ones. Thank you, thank you. Comes with the practice. <laughs> um, we have that was a terrible segue. Uh, thanks for ruining the segue by talking about the segue. Uh, we have <laughs> we have the Dolphins. They're they're twenty three point underdogs against Dallas. Like. What even is that? Like, is this is are they coming? Are, are the Cowboys hosting the Miami Dolphins or the Miami Hurricanes? Like, what even is this? Um, twenty four point underdogs. Twenty twenty three. Twenty three. So well, they were twenty eight point underdogs last week against the Patriots. Right? They are. Like it was. I think it was like twenty twenty one. Um, I don't know. But this is this is the biggest. This is this this is the biggest spread since twenty thirteen. Um, oh really? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Se- second biggest spread of the decade. So, I mean, what are you thinking? 23 points? You like the Dolphins there? <laughs> uh, no. 
<laughs> yeah. No, I don't. Yeah. Uh, in my prediction, I had them losing by 21, so I guess I'm technically taking the Dolphins. But at some point, I mean, what happens if they lose this game by, like, 40, right? Let's go to the Dolphins. Uh, let me pull up the Dolphins schedule. Because at some point, we're going to have to make some bizarre decisions, right? What happens when they play the Patriots again later in the season? They, their last game of the season is at New England, right? Mm-hmm. What happens if the Dolphins are 0-15 and the Patriots are playing for a first-round bye? Like, what happens when the line is what happens when the line is Patriots minus 30? Like, at some point, it's, we, we it's reach... It's probably going to reach 30 in that situation. At some point, we reach, like, the breaking point. Like, how how big of a spread? Because normally, if we see a double-digit spread, we're like, wow, that's that's a mismatch. Uh, how big can we actually go? Like, that, we might be testing that this season. Well, uh, I guess we'll, we'll see. But I, I don't think the Dolphins' defense is the worst in the league, if that means anything. I mean, they've allowed 102 points, but continue. Right, but uh, I watched... Uh, at least half of both of their games, just, I don't know why, but um, yeah. I, I, had, I, had, uh, I had fantasy football players in both games. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of damage was done by the offense being the worst offense I've ever seen, and I watched the Texans play. I mean, it was terrible, yeah. It was two pick sixes against the Patriots, so that, that really... Yeah, you factor it in a factor it in a little bit. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know if the Dolphins have, you know, it's a top, it's a bottom five defense in the league for sure, but I, I don't think it's the last one. Yeah. Um, so we've got that matchup. Uh, we've got, you know, what what are some of these other matchups that are kind of striking you in Week Three as kind of being interesting? Uh, we talked a little bit about the Chiefs and Ravens. Um, I in my official predictions, which my my predictions will be up on my medium uh, by the time that this podcast comes out, but I have the Chiefs favored. I have the, I, I'm picking the Chiefs thirty one to twenty seven. The official spread is Chiefs minus six. What are you thinking about in that matchup? Chiefs minus six. Well, as I said, I really really don't know how how good the Ravens are. Yeah, I don't think any of us really do, but they they look good. But we'll see. They, they could be a top five team. They could be a top 15 team, you know? Yeah, I think that's so, the range we're working at. Do you like the Chiefs to win this game at home? I think just more because they're more established? Yeah, I think the Chiefs cover six. Mm. Okay, I'm not going for the cover, but I, I, I do agree with you on that one. What I think is could be really sneaky and could really be have the potential to be the best matchup of the week is our Sunday nighter, the Browns hosting the Rams. Rams, That's an interesting game for sure. Rams favored by a field goal on the road, uh, but obviously, you know, this could this could turn into a shootout very quickly. Um, has all that kind of potential, and the Browns with some more momentum coming off their Week One win against the uh, or their their uh, Week Two win against the Jets. Um, certainly expect them to be trending upwards as well. So I think that's a game that has a lot of firepower to it. Right. I don't like the, the Rams as as much as most people. I think Jared Goff is not a very good quarterback. I think he's same look to Mitch Trubisky, but he actually has a competent coach, and that's what's making the difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm not super high on him either, but I, I mean, I think he's probably borderline or maybe inside the top ten. I have, uh, you know, air quotes, studied film on Mitch Trubisky and Jared yes. Goff, which means I've watched YouTube videos about them. Yep. It, it, it seems like they're both mediocre quarterbacks. I think Goff is a lot better than Trubisky. But uh, my sneaky good game of the week is Raiders at Vikings. I think that's going to be a banger of a game. Okay. Uh, that's an interesting one. The Vikings, nine-point favorites at home. Uh, so I'm guessing you think it's not going to be that close. No, or, no, no, or, no. I'm, or I'm sorry, you think it will be closer. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. going to be close. I yeah, think yeah. The, the Raiders have a pretty good offense, solid defense, and the Vikings, you know... They work if they run the ball a lot. Yeah. Um, again, I think it's one of those ones where the Vikings are so inconsistent and Kirk Cousins is so inconsistent. Um, he He's really taken a lot of heat for his performance against the Packers last week, and I think that's kind of rightfully so. Uh, so I do think it could be it could be a bit of an interesting one. Um, 
you have, are you going to take the Raiders to win that game? I think, wait, we didn't even do predictions for the last one either. I still will take the Rams, and I, uh, I think you probably will as well. But um, do you like the Vikings to, to beat the Raiders, or are you going full upset? I like the Raiders to beat the Vikings nice. in Minneapolis. Good, good upset pick from, from Lewis there. Um, and it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a comeback. The Vikings are going to score like 17-0 in the quarter and a half and then they're not going to be able to score anymore. Yeah. My my big upset pick is going to be the Monday Nighter. I'm going Redskins over Bears. Again, not a lot of faith in Trubisky. I think they should probably be 0-2 at the moment. Um, but uh, I like the Redskins' ability at home to kind of... I mean, obviously, I don't I don't think this will be a very high-scoring game or really a particularly interesting game. Uh, but I do think in kind of that slugfest, you know, I, I even like Keenum more than I like Trubisky, so... There's kind of my thoughts on that one. And the Bears' defense will keep them in games, but I, I think at some point they're going to need to do something offensively. Right, well, the Bears have uh, a top three defensive player in the league in Eddie Jackson, so that's okay, going to no, keep them in every game. Okay, not the top three defensive player in the league I thought you were going to name. Well, you see, I, I'm full of surprises. No, Eddie Jackson is the best safety in the NFL I think he's the new Earl Thomas in, in the sense of he makes the secondary uh, play really well. Both both the Bears cornerbacks, they can play up on the receivers so because they know that Jackson has the range to cover anything in the backside. He's an incredible player, and he's the reason that the Bears are so good. I mean, I'm going to be the obvious and just say Khalil Mack. I think he has a part to play. I think the Bears are going to completely shut down Case Keenan. Make him look like a freshman college quarterback. Yeah, and we know he was in college for like seven years, so. They're going to miss three field goals and win 9-0. to zero. That's amazing. That's an amazing prediction. Um, uh, wrapping up with this, I think, I like the Cardinals to beat the Panthers. Um, i like them to get their first win. Uh, last game I think is really worth the, the talking about. Uh, Chargers are hosting the Texans. Resident Houston fan, do you think the Texans get this win on the road? Chargers have not looked great over the first two weeks. Uh, neither have the Texans. This is really. also this is also true. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say it's gonna be a low twenties game. Okay. Where both quarterbacks don't really do a lot, but I'm gonna say Texans over Chargers by one or two points. Mm, I got three. I said I said Texans 24-21. When you said low 20s, I was kind of hoping you would fire that out. Yeah, that that makes sense. I, th- I think it's going to be a good good game. Uh, Deshaun Watson's going to get sacked 17 times, but so is Phillip Rivers, so it's fine. All right, last quarterback standing win. Sounds good to me. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Lewis, for coming on the podcast. It's been a uh, ton of fun. Hopefully we'll see you later on in the season. I have a feeling that we probably will. Um, and enjoy your Sunday. Any closing thoughts or anything you want to plug? Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. If you guys want to follow me on Twitter, that's at LewisBerardi17, L-U-I-S-B-E-R-A-R-D-I-1-7. All right. And, of course, follow me on my medium at Connor Grohl, Twitter at Connor Grohl, and on the podcast, Connor Grohl Sports on iTunes, Apple Podcasts now, uh, or anywhere you listen to podcasts, but you already know that because you're here. And we cherish and, uh, every one of you viewers. If, if, if anybody is in the greater New York area, you can find me on christianmingle.com. Right. Um, please, please hit me up. Hit him up. All right, thanks for listening to the podcast, everybody. And we will see you next week. Peace. Goodbye.